Hello, hello all. Welcome to Mysteries with Davina. I am your host, Davina Shea, and today we're going to be talking about another serial killer. But first, let's read our riddle for this week. Today's riddle is the case of the wife in the kitchen. A man entered his house and was about to hang up his coat when he heard his wife shout, No, John, don't do it. There was a shot, and he could hear his wife fall down. When he entered the kitchen, he saw his wife and the gun lying on the floor. There was a police officer, a doctor, and a lawyer standing next to her. Who killed the man's wife, and how did the man know who it was? Stick around until the end of the show to hear the answer. Today's story is of Harrison Graham. It's not often that I regret learning a new word from the dictionary, but uh, today is one of those days, and that word is necrophilia. And if you don't know what that means, stay tuned. Harrison Graham, born in Philly on October 9, 1958. Graham's story starts in the troubled home that drove him out onto the streets where he felt loved. He became a prostitute, and his pimp was also his lover. Graham used to sell drugs and eventually started selling them to boost his finances. Guess that makes sense. I've heard that's a, a very lucrative career. When Graham was a teenager, his mother had a sort of spiritual awakening and dragged him back to the house away from the streets, telling him how immoral his lifestyle was. And she was not too far off. As an adult, he was well liked by his neighbors. They described him as easy going. And the women he was around in the building were not afraid of him at all. They even asked him to do handiwork for them. Along came summer of 1987. No one knew what he was doing behind closed doors. Neighbors started to smell something foul in the complex and called the police. They responded and found what was causing the horrific smell behind a nailed shut door. They found the decomposing bodies of women behind this door. Now, just to kind of set the scene a little bit, we're talking summer, August. You know, one of the hottest months of the year. And uh, we're talking a stench, an awful stench, you know, dead body stench mixed with heat. Ugh. One officer who responded to the call said they could smell death when he walked into the complex. Uh, he followed the smell up to the third floor apartment. He found moldy newspapers, food containers, a knee-high pile of filthy clothes, and dried feces when he went inside. He also stated that someone had drawn a naked woman on the wall and that the words were written in what looked like dried blood. The officer walked past the kitchen to a door he assumed led to a room. The smell was thickening around him, and he felt certain that the cause was coming from behind the door. Below was an open keyhole. When he reached said nailed shut room, he looked through the keyhole and could see a body. At first glance, he thought the person was alive, so he demanded they open the door. But there was no response. This led him to calling for backup. The door was pried open and on the mattress was the body of a decomposing African-American woman. Besides the bed, there was another decomposing female body. At first, these officers were not sure if these women had died due to drug overdose, but when they searched the rest of the apartment, they found a woman that was so decomposed she was only a skeleton. They realized that whatever was happening had been happening for a long time. The fourth body found was wrapped in sheets. She was pretty much mummified. In between two mattresses was the fifth body that was so decomposed it was impossible to tell at that time if it was even male or female. Spoiler, it was a female. And in the closet amongst the trash was a sixth body. I guess that goes to tell you what he thought about these people that he murdered. The search for that day was called off eventually because of the extremely uncomfortable conditions. By that time, crowds of people had started to gather around the building, not just neighbors or locals either. 
The media had heard about the situation as well, and now there was news crews gathering around the building too. The next day, August 10th, investigators searched outside the apartment and found a leg and a foot on top of the building. The victims were autopsied. The first two bodies had decomposed rapidly as a result of the climate. They had, in fact, only been dead a few days. While the coroners were able to assess their gender as female, the other victims were less identifiable. Within a week, the public would serve to be more aid in helping the police solve identity mysteries. Um, a couple of the people that I found were identified because of some clothing, like a husband had come forward and said that... Uh, the shirt description matched the shirt that he had bought for his wife, and someone else had claimed that the, a necklace matched the description of a necklace a sister had worn, stuff like that. Five days later, the search brought into another apartment complex down the street where a body found in the basement was wrapped similarly to the other victims. It was wrapped in a blanket and bound with electrical cord, but only the torso and skull remained leading investigators to wonder if the previous body parts found belonged to this corpse. By this time, police had already identified Graham as the number one suspect and were quick to get his photo out for everyone to be on the lookout for him. On August 17th, Graham's mother received a call from him asking her to bring him food. She convinced him to turn himself in, and so he did. Police were notified of his location, and they met him on a street corner where he turned himself in. His first victim was his former girlfriend, Robin de Chazur. Uh, Graham stated in an interview, I wanted so badly to love her, but I could not stop my need to do other things. I never liked the sex, and it got so much easier when I didn't have to see her. Well, I don't know. Then close your eyes. Harrison somehow felt more at ease having sex with his girlfriend once he had strangled her. Good grief. In a sense, he had said that his secrets were safer with her dead. And uh, that she knew about Marty and his desires. And uh, he said, uh, I didn't want her looking at me that way. And I seen God being angry through her eyes. Well, no kidding. If I was God, I'd be angry at you, too. Harrison also confessed that uh, after killing Robin, he was so shaken by what he had done and so afraid as to what to do next that he simply left her body in his apartment. It was not until he brought a different woman to his apartment that he attempted to conceal her by hoisting the corpse onto his roof through a bedroom window. Okay, so this would lead me to believe that maybe that's how the leg and the foot got on top of the roof. Because uh, that just wasn't making sense, you know what I'm saying? Like, he just uh, holds on to these bodies in his apartment, you know, he's making a collection kind of a thing. So it doesn't make sense to me, the dismemberment, but I think that was an accident. I think he was trying to hide her body, and uh, she was kind of falling apart on him, and... Uh, he just left the pieces there, you know. Anyway, Harrison Graham lured all of his victims, whether he knew them previously or met them on the street, with drugs. Consensual sex led to strangulation, which Harrison explains always shocked him in the morning when he'd awake to find a woman lying next to him dead. Well, by golly gee, I'd be shocked to find somebody dead next to me in the morning too, but I wouldn't be shocked if I had been the one that caused it. When Graham was being interrogated, he wrote a 10-page long confession. His public defender, Joel Moldovsky, said that Graham was suffering from mental illness during the arraignment, so he wasn't capable of making this confession. Also, despite Graham's mother being in the interrogation, he claimed that Graham was not told that he could have an attorney present. Uh, Graham was assessed by Dr. Robert Stanton, a psychiatrist who said his IQ was only 63, mm. which uh, usually indicates mental incompetence. On top of that, Graham's drug use meant that he was incapable according to the Philadelphia law. The psychiatrist said that Graham had psychosis, chronic paranoia, auditory hallucinations, and blackouts because of his drug abuse. 
A psychologist by the name of Albert Levitt testified that aside from the defendant's chemical and psychological issues, Harrison was incompetent in fundamental academic skills like reading, writing, math, and even telling time. Well, my goodness, what a terrible combination. The man's not intelligent. He can't even do basic skills. Uh, well, I mean, I guess the only thing that apparently he's any good at is killing people. Moldovsky continued to argue that Graham was mentally unwell and he said that he had multiple personality disorders. According to Moldovsky, Graham would regularly speak in second and third personality. One of his personalities was Marty, the easygoing handyman, popular with the neighbors, religious, and heterosexual. Junior, another personality, was like a child and would be seen carrying around a Cookie Monster stuffed toy. His third personality, Frank, hated women. Frank was the personality that was killing the women and engaging in necrophilia. Ugh. Before the judge ruled on the mental health claim, a witness named Paula was brought in who claimed she lived with Graham for three years. According to Paula, Graham often strangled her during sex. She said he had bragged to her about killing Robin de Chazor and having sex with her corpse. She said she was scared to leave him because he killed de Chazor because she threatened to leave him. Now, there was discrepancies between Paula's claims and the facts of the murder. She wasn't strangled like Paula said, Graham had said. Instead, she was beaten to death and there was no history of Graham having any long-term relationships. Now, I would like to know where the prosecution pulled this woman from because this sounds like somebody was just seeking to insert themselves. You know what I'm saying in the case like... This man was incapable of having a long-term relationship with anybody. Uh, you know, obviously he tried. I don't know how long he was dating this Robin woman, but, uh, you know, obviously that ended rather quickly. So where this woman came from or why she even said what she said, it just didn't make sense. Graham told the judge that he wasn't the killer on March 8th and that someone else had done it. You know, actually, I had read uh, that during the interviews, he had actually said that uh, he found the bodies inside his apartment. <laughs> you know, the man, obviously with an IQ of 63, he's not that smart. But uh, to try to convince police that he just came home and they were there, and so he just left them there like... I, I didn't know what to do with them, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just came home one day, and there was one, and then there was two, and then there was six, you know? That's crazy. Anyway, he waived his right to a jury and put his fate in the hands of the judge. I'll never understand why people do this. I really feel like you always got a better chance going with the jury. You know, there's more people, and more people have to be convinced, and they, you know... But, you know, when you put your hands in the judge, that's it. You know, he's going to make one decision, one person, and it most likely, you know, he wasn't going to get away with it anyway. There's too much evidence. But still, still, you know what I mean? Graham was, of course, found guilty on all counts of first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. Graham had no reaction when the verdict came back. He just asked to get his cookie monster back. In May, the judge ruled that he would give Graham six death sentences, but uh, Graham had to spend life in prison first, which meant he would not get executed, and he was also sentenced to six sentences of 7 to 14 years to be served consecutively. My goodness, talk about overkill. You know, I've never understood this whole thing either, you know, when they give him two life terms, this and that. Uh, you know, you only have one life, you know what I'm saying? So, uh... This packing of sentencing, I don't get it, but, uh, you know. I guess the point of this is because he wanted to make sure that there was no possibility that this man would ever get out on parole. But I, I think that's taken care of when you sentence someone to death, you know what I mean? But, uh, I don't know. In 1994, the Supreme Court conducted a systematic review and decided Graham's sentence was illegal and unethical. So, an execution date of December 7, 1998 was set. And what? Oh my goodness. Where is the logic in this? You know, they say, oh my goodness, that sentence, it is illegal and unethical. 
Go ahead and kill him. <laughs> what? The sentencing of spending life in prison, you know, I think he would think that was more humane, don't you think? Uh, but instead they say, no, no, just get it over with. Just December 7th, 1990, yeah, 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 go ahead, kill him. And ironically, the judge who initially gave Graham's verdict was in charge of seeing if his death sentence would stay or not. He said it should stay. Oh, how does that even make sense? Do you telling me like the Supreme Court says, "Hey, man, that uh, that sentencing that you gave him, that's that's illegal." Uh, but go ahead, try again, try again. Should he should he die? Let me know. And the judge is like, "Yeah, yeah, he should die." Well, of course. What was he gonna say? No, no. Just let him stay in prison. I mean, why even bother asking the same judge? He's going to come to the same conclusion. He's just going to tweak things a little bit. But anyway, so the ruling was made that Graham's life sentence would be overturned and that his death sentence would be implemented. And then, of course, he went through a string of appeals, appeal after appeal, and the Supreme Court eventually actually banned mentally disabled inmates from being executed after 2002. At first, Graham did not meet the mental retardation criteria because although his IQ was under 70, he was still a functioning adult. Finally, he was saved by the requirements created by the American Psychiatric Association that stated if mental illness was present before a person was of 18 years of age, an execution could not occur. Talk about being saved by the bell. Currently, Graham resides in a medium security prison and will not be released. He is described as nonviolent. He has attained a religious minister's certification and uh, continues to practice his faith. And that, my friends, is where Harrison Graham's story ends. Well, not technically. He's still alive, but uh, that's where it ends for now. And now, what you've all been waiting for, the answer to today's riddle. The man knew it was the police officer who had his name, John, on his badge. What did you all think of that riddle? Did you guess the right answer? Let me know in the comments. Thank you all so much for joining me today. If you enjoy this type of content, please do subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and uh, I'll see you all next time.